Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 18th of August and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 21st of August 2023. It's not been a good week for the FTSE 100, um, five looking on course for five days of declines on top of a, four, uh, on top of a poor finish to the end of last week um, with the index down over 4% over the last five days down at five week lows and more broadly while the performance of the DAX has been slightly better the narrative for this week has been pretty much a case of stock market weakness. Um, so what's caused it? Well there's a number of factors at play. Um, concerns about the health of the Chinese economy, uh, the, the, the banking system, the property sector, um, country garden, um, potentially restructuring there. You've also got Evergrande filing for Chapter 15 bankruptcy protection in New York. Um, and um, a missed coupon payment or a missed payment from Zhongji, which is a Chinese um, wealth trust fund, which suggests that perhaps it has significant exposure to the Chinese real estate market. So there's there's an awful lot of concern about the growth prospects for the Chinese economy. Saw more disappointing economic data earlier this week in the form of retail sales, industrial production, all coming in well below um, expectations. Unemployment rate in China ticked higher and they didn't publish a number for youth unemployment. Um, which at the last count was around about 20.9%. So that's probably gone up. And Chinese youth unemployment measures the unemployment rates of those between 16 and 24. So we've got weakness coming out of China. That's a double-edged sword to some extent, because ultimately, I think if there was a big China rebound, then you could well see oil prices starting to head back towards $90 a barrel. The fact that we're getting a weak recovery out of China could well temper some of the upward pressure that we're seeing in inflation um, over here in Europe as well as the US. We've also seen um, higher bond yields this week. That's no better illustrated than in these particular charts here. This, for example, is the UK 10-year gilt yield which has hit its highest level since 2008. What's been notable, I think, recently about the rise in yields that we've been seeing on the bond market has, has been the fact that we've been seeing um, a significant increase in the longer end of the gilt curve as opposed to the shorter end. We, but that's not to say that the shorter end isn't rising too. It is. We've got UK two-year gilt yields here um, on the up over the course of the last five days. We're seeing a little bit of a pullback now. That's largely as a consequence of this week's um, wages, unemployment and inflation numbers. Today we got UK retail sales, which were disappointing, coming in much worse than expected. Um, but that's also got to be put in the context of the fact of how they're measured. Um, measured very much on a volume basis. Um, if you actually look at the value basis of UK retail sales, they're actually up. So essentially what's happening is because consumers are having to pay higher prices, they're having to pay more to get less. Um, if we looked at the July retail sales numbers in terms of spending, um, Barclay Card saw a big 15.8% rise in spending in July largely on the back of entertainment expenses. So um, stuff like um, cinema visits, music venues, live events, including Taylor Swift, um, Taylor Swift concerts, also saw big movie releases during July, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Barbie and Oppenheimer. So there was no Barbie bounce in retail sales, even if spending um, was higher than the previous years. Consequently, that disappointing retail sales number has prompted a little bit of a slide 
in gilt yields, though I would argue that that could well be just a consequence of a little bit of haven demand for bonds today on the back of the weakness that we're seeing in equity markets. If we look at, say, for example, um, US two-year yields, you'll probably see a similar sort of trend taking place. Just bring that up here. There we go. So we've gone and retested that 5% level on the two year, pulled back a little bit. If we go US 10 year, we can see that even though we've seen a move higher in two year, and we're seeing a little bit of a pullback again today in terms of yields. If you look at the 10 year, we're back at levels last seen in 2008. So again, seeing a little bit of a pullback after some strong moves higher in yields and the same applies to the the german german 2 and 10 year as well and and i think that speaks to a slight change i think in emphasis when it comes to interest rates i think for so long the debate has been about high how high, how high interest rates would be likely to go and i certainly think there is potential for more rate hikes, particularly from the Bank of England, even though those retail sales numbers were disappointing, we're still pretty much priced for a 25 basis points rate hike by the Bank of England at their September meeting. Although I would caveat that with the fact that we still have another CPI report um, and a wages and unemployment report between now and then. But certainly the wages data that we saw this week 7.8%, 8.2% if you include bonuses. Obviously, an awful lot of that bonus number was as a consequence of an NHS and public sector bonus, which is very much a one-off and is unlikely to be repeated. But certainly, 7.8% wages coming against a backdrop of an inflation rate that in June was at 79 um, means that we are slowly starting to claw back um, that real term, real time, real earnings, real earnings drop that basically has been that has hit UK consumers over the course of the past 18 months. We are now potentially starting to turn um, positive in terms of wages relative to inflation. And I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily think that is a bad thing. It's certainly not a wage price spiral which is what some people on the Bank of England are suggesting it might be. What's happening is that wages are slowly starting to catch up to the 15, 20% increase in food prices and other prices that have been squeezing consumer incomes over the past 18 months. That for me is not a reason to hike interest rates aggressively further. Um, ultimately, we still have quite a bit of lag to come through in terms of tightening, in terms of consumers rolling off their fixed rate mortgages and going on to new much higher fixed rates. And I don't think that we've seen even the beginnings of that um, start to um, take effect. And that is likely to be a potential drag going forward. On the plus side, however, um, savings rates have been edging higher over the course of the last six months. So if people have been on a fixed rate mortgage, they will certainly have been getting a higher return if they do have any savings. And inflation has been slowing. And if you shop around, um, you can certainly, I think, get much lower prices relative to what food price inflation is currently trending at at 12.4%, particularly if you've got a loyalty card. Or what have you. So I would imagine that in some respects you are already seeing price cuts on um, staple goods like milk, eggs and what have you. Um, looking forward, um, it's going to be a fairly, well it's shaping up to be a fairly light macro week coming up. We've got the Jackson Hole Annual Symposium which starts on the 24th. Um, this week's this week's Fed minutes just gone. Didn't really um, add to the su add to the sum of overall knowledge when it comes to what the Fed is likely to do in September. The bias, I think, for me is still erring towards a 
an, another pause, a hold, if you like. Um, I think one of the things that stood out from this week's minutes that there was only two US policymakers who favoured a hold or erred towards holding rates in July. I would have expected it to have been more than that. And essentially, I think that's what also helped push rates higher. But certainly in terms of the framing of the debate um, around how high interest rates are likely to go, I think people are now more concerned about not by how much further they have to go, but how much, how long are they likely to stay at current levels. And I think that's why you've seen rates at the longer end start to go higher, because I think there was a perception um, which has now started to shift that once we'd hit peak rates, we'd see rate cuts quite quickly. That no longer looks to be the case. However, obviously that doesn't, um, that doesn't uh, include the scenario whereby China exports deflation um, because of an economic slowdown there. So I think we need to obviously keep that in the back pocket. We've already seen PPI in the UK um, head into negative territory in the July numbers. And I think the bigger concern going forward, it's not so much about headline CPI, it's about really about how resilient core CPI is. Um, and that remains steady in July at around about 6.8%. But certainly I think on the headline numbers, we should start to see um, headline inflation head back towards 5% by the end of this year which would obviously be in line with the government's target, but ultimately um, that has absolutely nothing to do with anything the government's done. It's just basically that will ha that should happen organically. So it's, an, it's, really a, it's really a fairly easy claim for uh, the government to make because ultimately inflation should, should come back to around about 5% by the end of the year anyway. Um, but anyway, looking, looking ahead to the Looking ahead to the, the Jackson Hole Symposium, um, I think the Fed's going to be fairly comfortable with the idea um, of being data dependent. I don't think that we're going to hear a victory lap from Powell. I think what we've seen from a number of Fed policymakers in recent weeks is that there, there are increasing splits and there is some concern about the effects that the current rate hikes have had and will have over the course of the next few months. And I think similarly, there are concerns on the Bank of England uh, Monetary Policy Committee leaning in a similar direction. So I think while we can sort of speculate about where the peak rate is for the UK and the markets have still got 6%, seriously, I, I, I really do doubt that. Um, but that's that being said, I wouldn't rule it out either, but certainly I think we're going to get 25 basis points in September. I think the bar is very high for us not to get that. Um, but as we look ahead to next week, I think the main focus will obviously be on Jackson Hole. We do have flash PMIs, which are due out on the 23rd for August. And we already know that manufacturing has been very, very weak um, on the on, on pretty much across the board for France, Germany. The UK as well. I mean, the Germany PMI for, for July came in from manufacturing PMI came in at 38.8. I mean, that's the worst level since the COVID lockdown in 2020. Yes, you know, just over a three and a half year low. So um, Germany is pretty much the sick man of Europe when it comes to its economy. Luck could well see a third quarter of economic contraction there. France was in negative territory for both services or on contraction territory, below 50 in other words, for manufacturing and services. Be interested to see whether that or not that remains the case. UK PMIs have been slightly more resilient. Um, saw 51.5 in July for services, 45.3 for uh, manufacturing. We've also got the German IFO survey as well. Um, which saw the business climate fall to its lowest level since October last year in July at 87.3. So not expecting to see much in the way of 
optimistic data um, in the silly season of August or the summer season, um, because I think you'll find that an awful lot of businesses may well shut down um, for um, for holiday for for that for that particular period. Um, so before we go on to the earnings numbers, let's have a quick look at some of the key support levels um, that we've been talking at. As I say, the FTSE 100 has had a bit of a shocker on course for its worst run of declines um, on a daily basis since October last year um, uh, in the wake of the quasi Quarteng budget. Here are the six declines here, one, two, three, not all the way back here. Um, so six, six daily declines there on course for a similar sort of run through here. The big level on the FTSE 100, 7,200 right there between that low there and that series of lows through there so coming up to a very key support level on the FTSE 100 similarly the DAX also the 200 day moving average but the lows back in July so that's around about 15,400 but also the 200 day moving average um, so that's going to be a very very key support level over the course of the next few days. We have already seen significant breakouts on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. We've both seen them break below their 50-day moving averages, but we've also seen them break below key support areas for the S&P 500, broken below 43.80, um, this, this series of lows through here, and also below the 50-day moving average. So momentum is definitely stalling there be interesting to see whether or not that is maintained and we see further declines but certainly the move higher in yields is not helping the Nasdaq and it's not helping the S&P. Fortunately we are still in the uptrend on the Nasdaq that we've been in since the start of this year so there is certainly potential for further weakness and a test of this key support area back in June which is 14,200 there or thereabouts. So approaching some key support levels on the NASDAQ, but the fact that we've broken below the 50 day moving average on both would appear to suggest that we could well be on course for further declines and perhaps US markets need to be, you need, we need to be thinking more in terms of sell the rally than buy the dip, but we'll have to see how that plays out over the course of the next few sessions. The dollar's also seen a fairly decent bid on the back of the recent concerns about high yields for longer, but also concerns about a broader slowdown um, in economic activity more broadly. Euro dollar looks as if it's going to be heading back to support at, on, on that trend line that I've drawn in there, but as, as well as the 200 day moving average at around, around about 107.30 at the moment, we're holding above. 108.30. So that's these two lows through here and uh, that support just below the lows that we saw yesterday. So 108.30 perhaps heading towards the 200 day moving average and that trend line support from the lows back in March. But I'm actually quite surprised that euro dollar isn't weaker given the weakness that we're seeing in the data and I think some of the data that we're seeing out of Europe has prompted some on the governing council um, to perhaps reassess where their terminal rate actually is. Um, Martin Kazaks, Martin's Kazaks, I believe is the Latvian ECB um, governing council member who's previously fairly hawkish, um, has suggested that perhaps um, more rate hikes may not be the answer and perhaps they need to basically wait and see what transpires um, over the course of the next few months and perhaps they shouldn't push their luck on pushing for more aggressive tightening going forward. Pound however has, a has had a slightly more positive week, yeah we're seeing a little bit of weakness today and um, that's not surprising, come off the back of four days of fairly these five days of gains We've held that key support area through those lows from the 30th of June. 
which currently comes in around about 126, 12630. So if we get a break below 126, then that could well complete a potential head and shoulders reversal, perhaps left shoulder here, head here, bit of a messy right shoulder here. But if we do break below, then we could head back towards the 200 day moving average there. But at the moment, there's a fairly decent area of trend line support through there. And while that holds, um, we need to see a break back above the 50 day moving average, which we're, we're currently struggling to get back through um, in the short to medium term. Euro sterling. Let's quickly look at that. Back at the lows back in July. This is a range trade. This is a range trade all day, every day. Fairly decent support and at around 85. Resistance at 87 pays your money. It takes your choice. There's not really much going on there. Dollar yen. Now, dollar yen is a currency pair that I've really got massively wrong. I really thought that with the Bank of Japan looking to pivot on its monetary policy, that would be beneficial for the yen. It could well be. It could well be. But at the moment, um, any dollar shorts are getting squeezed. And at the moment, we still I'm still not convinced that um, we can't potentially go back higher towards 147, 150. The Bank, of, the Bank of Japan has shown no inclination that it wants to intervene. And the last time it intervened, it intervened at around 145, 146, where we're there now. And we haven't seen much evidence of that thus far. However, if equity markets do go full risk off, that should be positive for the yen. Um, and push the yen higher and the dollar lower. We'll have to wait and see whether or not that transpires. But Japanese inflation is still at 4.3% and starting to look a bit sticky. It remains to be seen how long the Bank of Japan can afford to ignore that. Um, in terms of the earnings numbers, we've got Harbour Energy. Obviously, there, all their profits got wiped out by the windfall tax um, last year. They've, there was some speculation earlier this year that they were in talks with a US oil company called Talos Energy. I think it was Talos Energy, US-based Talos Energy. Um, they're already partnered with Talos in an oil and gas field in the Gulf of Mexico. And this move, if it does play out, could well see Harbor Energy um, potentially um, drop any future investment in the UK and just carry on with basically um, refocus its efforts elsewhere. And to be quite honestly, who can blame them? If we look at the key support and resistance area on this particular chart, we can see that 270 is a key resistance level. It'd be interesting to see um, whether or not um, Harbour Energy is able to generate any semblance of profits from it's largely domestic oil and gas producing. 90% of its production takes place through five key hubs here in the UK. Obviously, gas prices are lower, oil prices are lower, so revenues are also likely to be lower. Um, last but not least, we've got NVIDIA. Um, that's been a big AI play, artificial intelligence play. Still very much in the uptrend that it's been in pretty much since the start of this year. It's due to announce its second quarter earnings on the 23rd of August. As a quick recap, back in May, the shares got a significant lift after surpassing expectations on first quarter revenues coming in at $7.2 billion. Raised its revenue guidance for Q2 to record-breaking $11 billion. Now, that's a huge increase on its Q2 numbers of previous years or any other quarter, it would be a record quarter. Um, the improvement is expected to be driven by um, a big increase in sales of data center chips, along with investments in artificial intelligence. In Q1, data center chips alone generated $4.28 billion, followed by gaming, which generated $2.24 billion. For Q2, data center revenue is expected to come in at $7.28 seven eight billion dollars which is more than the entire revenues that they generated in q1 gaming expected to remain fairly flat at around about 2.4 billion dollars with profits expected to come in at two dollars and seven cents a share um 
NVIDIA, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang um, laid out a statement of intent in June announcing a raft of new AI related products which help which could help shape how the company's network and advertise. So there's potentially huge growth prospects there. The bigger question is, is whether or not all of that is priced in and whether or not their Q3 guidance um, will be slightly more modest. We've also got numbers from Q2 numbers from Snowflake as well and Zoom video on the 21st. Um, so that's I think I think I pretty much covered everything that I need to um, cover for this week. Once again, thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all have a great weekend and uh, speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much for listening and have a nice weekend.